Brothers and sisters, please forgive me. You can have a seat. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. As we all know, we heard through the hymns last night, is today in the Orthodox Church, we celebrate the liturgical New Year following an ancient Byzantine practice. However, what I want to talk about today is we also commemorate St. Simeon the Stylite, a, sa a saint that evokes in some scandal, but also in the mind of others, some uh, kind of blessedness. An ancient historian describes St. Simeon like this, endeavoring to realize in the flesh the existence of the heavenly host lifted himself above the concerns of earth and overpowering the downward tendencies of man's nature was intent upon things above. Placed between earth and heaven, he held communion with God and united with the angels in praising him. From earth, offering his intercessions on behalf of man, uh, and from heaven drawing down upon them the divine favor. St. Simeon was born in a village called Sissa in ancient Syria. He was actually an Antiochian saint. Uh, as a humble shepherd, he once went to the divine liturgy where he heard the Beatitudes, what we heard earlier today. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for th righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Simeon, upon hearing these, this beautiful gospel reading, asked one of the experienced elders how he could obtain these things that were spoken about in the Beatitudes. And the elder pointed him to the monastic life. When Simeon was then 18 years old, he left his parents without their knowledge. He ran away and received the monastic tonsure and devoted himself to feasts of the strictest abstinence and unceasing prayer. For example, he once tied a palm rope, which I've read has been described as a very rough kind of texture thing around his body underneath his clothes so that he could hide it from others. This caused him to bleed, uh, but he tried to hide that bleeding. However, the other brothers in the mo monastery started noticing the blood and worse, the smell coming off of him, and reported him to the abbot. His zeal, beyond the strength of the other monastic brethren, so alarmed the abbot, he told Simeon that he had to either moderate his ascetic deeds or to leave the monastery. So Simeon left. He went to one of the more uninhabited places in the mountains, a dangerous part of the mountain, and found a waterless and not too deep well and lowered himself down into that well, singing hymns, and continuing his unceasing prayer to God. After five days, angels appeared in a dream to the abbot of the monastery he had left, who commanded the abbot to bring Simeon back to the monastery. So he sent out two men with orders to search for him, and they brought him back somewhat unwillingly. St. Simeon, however, did not last long in the monastery. After a short while, he settled into a stony cave and he dwelt there for three years, all the, while, all the while again perfecting himself in monastic feats. Always eager to grow in virtue, the saint wanted to endure the 40-day Great Lenten fast without eating, like the divine men, Moses and Elijah, and also in imitation of our Lord's fast in the desert before he started his ministry. He attempted to persuade his priest friend, Father Basus, to seal the door of the cave during this time so that he couldn't leave. Father Bassus pointed out the difficulty and danger of this endeavor, endeavor, not eating for 40 days. And almost in a negotiation, and I'm not giving anyone permission to negotiate with their father here, their father confessor, but Simeon, he's a saint, so he can do these things. Almost in a negotiation, St. Simeon asked the priest to then leave 10 loaves of bread and a pitcher of water and, you know, if he became hungry or thirsty, he would partake of them. The cave was sealed, and for 20 days, St. Simeon prayed while standing, and for 20 days while sitting, so not to per permit his body to relax. At the end of the 40 days, Father Basus came and removed the seal, and when he went inside, he found all the loaves of the bread untouched and the pitcher full of water, and Simeon lying almost breathless unable to speak or move. So his friend, 
sponged out his mouth, and communed him in the precious body and blood of Christ. Simeon then rose up, took a small amount of nourishment, and amazingly went on as if nothing had happened. For the next 28 years, brothers and sisters, St. Simeon repeated this practice for every great Lent. I struggle to keep the, the great Lenten fast as it is, and this man didn't eat during that time. Father Basus, overcome with astonishment at this ascetical comp, uh, accomplishment, went back to his own flock and told them everything about saint, uh, the saint. And the saint's reputation began to spread, and people came out to meet him, not just those in neighboring regions of his cave, but also those who lived as far away as Britain, Spain, and France. And I don't have to tell you this, but this is before the time of train travel, you know, airplane travel, you know, you had to walk. So from France to, to Syria is not a, a light feat. So they brought their sick. Couples who were childless came to ask his prayers to have children. People brought their disputes before him, and he intermediated between them. Or they came just to hear a word of Christian edification. And through the intercessions of this great saint, they received what they asked for. And his reputation as a holy man spread further and further and further. But Simeon, being a humble man and, uh, and shunning worldly glory, people started coming to him, right? Coming to his cave, long for his lost solitude. And he chose a previously unknown act of asceticism. He went up to a pillar about six to eight feet high and settled upon it in a little cell, devoting himself to intense prayer and fasting. So if we, we don't have a, a, an icon of St. Simeon, but if we did, he's always shown on top of a pillar kind of sitting, right? Uh, and this is why he's called a stylite. This is the Greek word stylos for Greek, or for pillar in Greek. Reports of St. Simeon reached the highest church uh, hierarchy in the imperial court. Patriarch Dominos II, from, who was around the 5th century, 441, 448 of Antioch, visited the monk, celebrated divine liturgy on the pillar with him, and communed this ascetic with the holy uh, mysteries. The holy fathers who were living at that time in the desert, heard about St. Simeon and how he'd chosen this new and strange form of ascetic striving, wanting to test this new ascetic and determine whether his extreme asceticism, ascetic feats were pleasing to God, they sent messengers to him to tell him to come down from his pillar. They wanted to test whether Simeon was performing this ascetic feat out of vanity and pride. Uh, hey, look at me, I can sit up on top of a pillar. Look how holy I am. In the case of disobedience, these men were to forcibly drag him down to the ground. But if he was willing to submit, they were to leave him on his pillar. When the messengers told Simeon to come down, Simeon, in his humility, was immediately obedient, and he began to climb down. The messengers, seeing this humility and being assured of his authenticity, told Simeon, stop, stay where you're at. Go back to your pillar and continue your prayer and fasting, asking God for help. St. Simeon endured many temptations, and invariably he gained victory over them during this time. He relied not on his own weak powers, but on the Lord himself, who always came to help him. The monk gradually increased in the height of the pillar on which he stood. His final pillar was 80 feet high. I was thinking about what is 80 feet high? It's something like, what is that? That's like one of the light, uh, like the, the big kind of like electricity poles that you see out on uh, an eagle, like a big old high thing, right? Um, and then also a double wall was raised around him, you know, which hindered again these unruly crowds of people coming too close and disturbing his prayerful concentration. Everyone wanted the advice of, of this saint. Women in general were not permitted to uh, be on the wall. The saint did not make an exception even for his own mother, who after a long and unsuccessful searches finally succeeded in finding her lost son. He would say to her, he would not see, uh, he would not see her saying, if we are worthy, this is beautiful, if we are worthy, we shall see one another in the life to come. His, saint, his mother is also a saint, Saint Martha, submitted to this, remaining at the foot of the pillar in silence and prayer, where she finally died. St. Simeon asked that her, then finally, asked that her coffin be brought to him up the pillar, and he reverently bid farewell to the dead mother, 
and joyfully a smile came up on her face. Beautiful. St. Simeon spent 80 years in arduous monastic uh, feats, 47 years of which he stood on a pillar. Many pagans accepted baptism struck by this moral staunchness and bodily strength which the Lord had bestowed upon his servant. The first one to learn of the death of the saint was his closest disciple, Anthony. Concerned that his teacher hadn't appeared to the people for three or four days, he would come out uh, at a point in time, like at four o'clock in the afternoon, to preach to the people. He didn't show up one day, two days, three days, four days. He went up on the pillar and found the dead body, not, not like he didn't fall off the pillar. This is what you would think would happen, right? They'd fall off the pillar and perish. He was standing in prayer as he was dead. This is how I want to die, standing in prayer. Patriarch Martyrios of Antioch performed the front funeral service before a huge throng of people and clergy. They buried him near his pillar at the place of his ascetic deeds. Anthony established a monastery upon which rested the special blessing of St. Simeon. Brothers and sisters, some people look at this incredible ascetic feats of St. Simeon and are scandalized. Like, what a freak. What is this guy doing? I was researching this homily and I found more Protestant uh, like apologetics against this saint, saying he's out of his mind and these people are worshiping him like a saint, right? They might ask themselves, is this the type of self is this type of self-flagellation really necessary? Does the God of mercy really desire us to punish ourselves to this degree? To answer this question, we have to remind ourselves a few things. First and foremost, all humanity suffers a disorder. And if I could use an analogy of a train, the train engine normally guides and pulls the caboose down the track. Things are out of order when the caboose tries to guide and pull the train. In this analogy, the train engine is the rational soul, and the caboose is the body. When things are out of order, when we put the body in charge of the soul, it's like the caboose, the body, is attempting to lead the rational soul into the kingdom of God. However, anyone who knows anything about trains or gravity or physics knows that the only direction a caboose can lead and guide an engine is downhill when it's going down. St. Simeon knew this. He knew he wanted these, those promises from God that he had heard in the Beatitudes. On the day he heard, heard them in the divine liturgy, blessedness, being comforted, meekness, being filled with righteousness, mercy, pureness of heart, and so that he could see God, that is to have full communion with the living trinity. And he knew he had to put the engine, his soul, back in charge of the body. And he took extreme steps to cure this disorder with the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, it is in this sense that the Orthodox understands penance. Penance for the Orthodox Church does not mean punishment for sins committed. That is, the Orthodox does not approach the healing of this disorder that we talked about in a legalistic manner, where all sin requires punishment. Rather, the Church in its therapeutic manner and approach to the healing of this sin or this disorder sees punishment like a prescription. Uh, like you might get from your doctor. For example, when I go to confession, the priest might prescribe prostrations for me to heal a certain aspect of my personal disorder. Much like my doctor might prescribe medicines for my physical ailments and my disorders. This is why, uh, this is why the way that Simeon approached the, his asceticism. He was not punishing himself for the sins which, which his symptoms which were just simply symptoms of his disorder. Rather, he was attempting to heal the disorder itself by subduing the body and putting the rational soul back in charge of the body. And y'all might be thinking, why so extreme? Do we all have to do this? Does my asceticism, asceticism need to match that of St. Simeon to enter the kingdom of, of heaven? The answer to this is the same answer I've been getting from many doctors that I've asked this question to over the last few weeks at the hospital. It depends. They always answer that way. When is she going to be better? It depends. By denying myself 
by denying himself, Simeon, while on earth, became more angelic, became more closer to God, became more able to see God, more like God. In the next life, this won't change. He will be closer to the throne of God. That is, it depends on how we develop our relationship with God in this life that will define our relationship to God in the next. Second, Simeon was a true embodiment of the monastic ideal to pray without ceasing, as we hear in 1 Thessalonians. Simeon's aim in climbing the pillar was not, therefore, to be a spectacle, but to set himself apart and to commit himself entirely to prayer and to penance with his whole body at all times. The fact that his pillar got taller and taller as time went on uh, did serve as a striking visual reminder of the intermediary prayer power of prayer, but it was not an act of pride or showmanship. Theodoret of Cyrus, uh, which was a, he was a contemporary of St. Simeon, explains the needs for Simeon's pillar in this way. He said, just as God deigned for a strange and startling signs to be manifest through the prophets, for example, Hosea's marriage to a prostitute, or Ezekiel laying his, on his side for 40 days, so God also ordained Simeon's pillar to be a sign. If Simeon is a scandal for us, therefore, the true scandal is that we do not believe in the grace of God, in the power of prayer, like Simeon did, who dedicates one's whole life to the perpetual contemplation of God, to persistent supplication, to earnest self-mastery, is to us absurd, absurd sometimes. Although Christ tells us that Mary, who sits motionless at his feet, has the better part than Martha, who busies herself with many works. If, uh, do we believe this, brothers and sisters? If we do not believe this, then Simeon is just a fanatic sitting on a pole. Nothing more. Not an example for us. But if we understand Simeon's life as not only as one of perpetual prayer, prayer but also of sacrifice, Simeon can be adopted as the perfect saint for our modern times. What more do we need now in this fast-paced, demanding, screen-filled lives than someone who achieves holiness without moving? Simeon can serve for us an icon of a saint who planted himself where God had put him and remained there, believing that God could work through the most banal circumstances, that of man standing still, opening his heart to God. Simeon's life also reminds us of a very important lesson that we tend to forget. We cannot escape suffering. Despite all the advances of modern medical science, and, in, uh, and indeed suffering in, is the means of our union with Christ. We can take our suffering and have that transformed and have that be, be our way to Christ. If we dedicate it in faith to Christ, Simeon essentially did nothing. He did not move. He didn't marry. He didn't have a job. Yet he suffered immensely, standing still in rain, snow, pushing his physical body to its limits. And when we, like St. Simeon, embrace that suffering, it can transform us. This meaning of suffering is beautifully captured by a story from uh, St. Simeon's life. It says, a king of the Arabs comes to see Simeon and to ask for prayers. Simeon has, a, again, a rope tied around tightly around his waist, and, it, and it's gnawing at his flesh. And maggots have begun to take him, like their, their home there, on his flesh, basically. One of these maggots falls from atop the pillar to the foot of this king. And our initial reaction is, gross, gross, like I can hear Natalia, ah, maggots. Or like, our initial reaction is, is, uh, is one of disgust. We want to turn away from this suffering and from this unseemly, needless, penitential fervor of this saint. Our reaction to this extreme instance of suffering, however, is only amp an amplified version of our own reaction to all suffering. People, especially in America, do not like suffering. They don't like to see it. We obviously don't like to suffer it, right? Um, I'll take a short aside. St. Nicholas, the grand, uh, the the emperor of Russia used to make his children, who were the richest people in uh, on the country, take cold showers in the morning. Why? To taste a little suffering. 
So we don't like suffering. We turn away from it. It's the harsh reality of life. We don't like to see it, and especially death. We don't like to see it. But this pilgrim king is seeking an in earnest, and he does not recoil. Seeing that something has fallen from the saints, he picks it up. And to his surprise, and our surprise, he found that what is in his hand, hand is not a worm, but a pearl. The king interprets this sign as one of forgiveness and blessing brought about by Simeon's ceaseless prayer. In other words, Simeon's suffering has been transfigured by his love for Christ into something precious. His suffering has become a pearl of great price, as we read about in Matthew chapter 13. Brothers and sisters, the one point I would like you to take from all of this story is that we must take the therapies that our spiritual fathers prescribe us to help heal our disorders, whatever they may be. And this is often accomplished by, accompanied by suffering, which we may accept as pearls of great price or maggots. It's our choice. If you suffer, thank God that he has accounted you worthy of this and allow this suffering to purify your soul that you might find a place closer to the throne of God in the next life. Through the intercessions of the Saint, of Saint Simeon, the stylite, whose memory we commemorate today, and of all thy saints, O Lord Jesus Christ, uh, our God, have mercy and save us. Amen.